So first off, um, thank you very much for attending today's information session about the Master of Management Analytics program here at Smith School of Business. Uh, my name is Dean McEwen. I'm the director of the blended version of this program. And uh, as we go through today's information session, um, you will see that there's a, a Q&A button inside Zoom. And so um, if you want to submit your questions there, uh, basically what will happen, I have my colleagues, Liz and Alex are here. They're going to be answering those questions via text um, as they come in. And if they think that your question is very relevant and the rest of the attendees should hear it as well, they're going to leave it for me and I will um, I will ask that question or address that question at the end of the webinar. So again, hopefully uh, you're at the right place. Uh, this is for the Master of Management Analytics program. Uh, it's offered uh, through Smith School of Business. We have two different formats. We have an in-person one and a blended one. We'll talk about that in a sec. Okay. All right. So the first thing I want to do is... Um, uh, and a land acknowledgement. Um, now, these are something that we do here at Smith. It's sort of a way that we can, you know, insert and build an awareness of Indigenous presence and land rights in our everyday lives. So that's why we include a land acknowledgement. Our program uh, actually spans across all of Canada and even around the world as well. So uh, we're not, you know, specific to areas in around Kingston or around Toronto. So that's why I have this map of Canada. But land acknowledgements are really a, an opportunity to recognize the history of colonialism and First Nations, you know, as well as an understanding of the change that's needed in settler colonial societies. Um, because I'm the director of the blended program, you know, I started to research which Indigenous communities I should include in my land acknowledgement. And because our students are from across Canada, like literally the current class, I've got students touching all three oceans around Canada. Um, and this map is really what I discovered, right? The depth, breadth, and the reach of numerous Indigenous communities across Canada. Um, so I ask you to think more critically and comprehensively about Indigenous history, especially where we and where you live, learn, and play. You know, please discover which Indigenous lands you live on. And what do you know about that territory? And what do you know about the Indigenous culture, the events, traditions, foods, that kind of thing? Um, I also encourage everybody to read and develop an understanding of the 94 calls of action identified in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's findings. I have made every effort to learn about these actions, and I know that I can make a difference by supporting call number 57, which is learning about Indigenous peoples, and not only educating myself, but as I'm doing right now, encouraging others to learn as well. And although I'm not an expert, I'm happy to share the resources that I have used on my own journey. Uh, the 93rd call to action asks newcomers to Canada to learn about the Indigenous peoples in Canada, and I would encourage you to learn about their traditions and ways of knowing as you build a new life here in Canada. Okay. Now, what is this degree and what's it all about? So first things first, we are a business school offering a very technical degree. Okay. This is a full master's degree. It is offered in 12 months. Uh, you can expect significant academic rigor as you go through the program. We do numerous assessments and evaluations. They include exams, assignments, team projects, presentations, and really this program itself will give you a, an amazing foundation to launch your career in the analytics professional space, All right? What we can do here is we'll help you build upon the strengths that you have. We're gonna have provide you some strategies on how to overcome some of your weaknesses and really be able to put your best foot forward as you go through and develop a career in analytics. And one of the key points of that is working with other people, okay? This is a team-based program. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in the future, but um, you know, technology is only gonna get you so far, right? And technology changes all the time. What doesn't change is people. People, that's the constant that you have to be able to work with and be successful with if you're to be successful yourself. And like any kind of academic program, right? And I'd certainly encourage lifelong learning as much as possible. But while you're in this kind of a program, this is really your opportunity to try new things. You practice your communications and your storytelling 
become better at what you're doing, accept critical feedback and be better for it, right? Because by upon this kind of reflection, you will become a better sort of manager, but also a future leader in your organization as well. And that's what these professional master's programs are really designed to do, develop leaders of tomorrow. Um, now this program itself is now available in two delivery formats, as I mentioned, blended, um, which is virtually or almost all virtual or online. Um, and then there's the in-person in Toronto sessions as well. Now, this is just a quick sort of introduction to what we look at in this program from a curriculum perspective. Okay, you need to have, you know, significant foundations in order to build success in data. And that starts at the bottom when I would look at this as a, a pyramid. Uh, you need to know about verified and trusted data, right? If you don't have good data and clean data, the, all the rest of the pyramid here will fall apart. It will never work. You need that foundational piece and you need to have the trusted data and the verified data. And then after that, we're gonna go through the four different types of what we'll call progressive analytics. Each of these types of analytics is equally important. Not one is better or more important than the other. They just have different functions and they're gonna help you make your evidence-based decision-making by leveraging what you've seen in the analytics piece. And ultimately what most organizations want to do is get into what we'll call artificial intelligence and automated decision-making. We don't really want people to be involved. The volume of data is so massive that what we want to do is be able to build models that can actually help in real time, right? Help an organization make decisions. So if you want to think about a quick example, you know, pricing on hotels and airlines, right? That's one of the biggest things. You don't want people to sit there and think, ooh, demand is high. Let's bump up the prices. You don't want that. You want a machine to take care of that for you. And that's what we're going to get. And I would take this a little bit further and, you know, and say, hey, you know what? It's, we're not even going to call it artificial intelligence. We're just going to call it evidence-based decision-making. And hopefully someday, you know, not people aren't even talking about what AI is or what analytics is. It's just ingrained in the decision-making process. And it's assumed that this kind of evidence is discovered and the insights are found. Okay. Now, these are the different types of analytics that we're going to be covered in the program. So we're gonna start with descriptive analytics. And descriptive analytics is just like what happened, right? Uh, basically, most people in most organizations will have a thing called a dashboard. Um, we used to call it business intelligence. Uh, it's basically, you know, how many widgets did we produce this month? How many people visited our website? How many, you know, computers were purchased today? That's descriptive analytics. So as you can see, that's a very important information to know, right? When you're monitoring your business, you want to know what's going on today. And you want to be as accurate and as in real time as possible. But most business decision makers, that's not good enough, right? You want to know what's going to happen tomorrow right? Okay, if I sold this many computers today, how many computers am I going to sell tomorrow? And that's where you start getting into models, right? The models are going to be looking at the past data that's there. They're going to be looking at trend lines and maybe linear regression, that kind of thing to think about, okay, you know what, if we did this today, we're going to do this tomorrow. We're going to assume that that's the case. The problem with that, most models are inherently broken at some point, and I would argue, you know, COVID and the pandemic has really shown that, right? That like, oh, wow, we can't, you know, guarantee there are variables out there that are going to mess up our models. They're going to mess up our prediction. So we can't do that. But we can do things in our organization to sort of ensure that an outcome happens. Okay, so that's where we get into things like prescriptive analytics. And really that's about the optimization of your organization and your decision making as well. So going back to my example of, you know, how many computers are we going to sell tomorrow? Basically what you can do is you can use prescriptive analytics to adjust the operations to make sure you hit those that sales volume if that's what you're looking at or you're filling up, you're selling those seats on that plane. You can use dynamic pricing, you can use sales, you can use marketing, um, you can build different uh, manufacturing facilities, that kind of stuff. You can hedge bets by buying up currency from foreign uh, countries, right? If you're doing international trade. There are things that you can do 
right, to optimize your operations to make sure that your predictions actually occur the way you expect them to. And that's extremely important. I think that's where a lot of organizations are today, really trying to think about, okay, how can we make sure that our business and our sales and everything else and our revenue stays constant where we track it or want it to be tracked and that kind of thing. And again, getting into what we call that cognitive analytics, and that's that self-learning bit, right? The artificial intelligence, we want to develop a system and a computer that will make these decisions for us. As you can imagine, my, my other example of you know airline ticket prices, um, you don't want to have to rely on people to intervene in that and adjust the prices. You want a computer system that's going to be looking at you know past prices. They're going to be looking at your models. They're going to be looking at you know, the existence of how many seats are available, how many people are looking at this particular flight at this particular time on a website right now and take all that information and price it accordingly and make sure that when that plane takes off, that it is full, right? Because one empty seat on that plane is lost revenue. Even if you sold it for five bucks, that's five bucks you don't have. Um, so it's really important because that's, a again, flights are fixed cost operations. Now, back to the program a bit, okay? So again, we are a business school offering a very technical program. So what do I mean by that and why is that important? So we have this broader approach to solving the problems using data and analytics, okay? We want to understand what the problem is that the business is focused on or faced with even before we start thinking about analytics and models and that kind of stuff, we want to have that root cause analysis to make sure that we can actually develop a hypothesis and think, okay, what's going on here? What do we think is causing this problem? And how do we think we're going to overcome this problem? And at that point, once you've got the hypothesis, then you can start thinking about, okay, I'm going to need these types of data, right? This data set, this data set all that kind of information. I think we can probably just do this with linear regression, or maybe we should think about using random forest or some other model out there and thinking about that. And then we do the analysis, right? And the point of the analysis is actually to get the insights that we need to make a decision that will then solve that business problem. And this is a very iterative process. This is not something where it's one and done. This is something you're going to have to revisit. You're really going to have to think about, okay, you know, critically think, like, is this solution that we've come up with now, is this actually going to solve the root cause of this problem? Or do we need to rethink this a little bit? Do we read the, rethink the models, rethink the data that we've got? and redo that. And we have this bit of a mantra here at Smith about test and learn, test and learn, right? You never wanna stop testing, you never wanna stop learning because there's always gonna be some variables in there that are gonna change the outcomes of your analytics. And so that's why it's really important. And again, that's where people come into play, right? And because we are a business school, we do want our graduates to be, you know, managers of analytics teams, we want people to be leaders in a digitally transformed organization. And so we provide this other environment in here, and I always call it the part of the culture of the program, is this team-based learning that we go through here. And that allows you to work with people and work with people very effectively and leverage different strategies to over, even think about yourself and your preferences, right? Are you an introvert? Are you an extrovert? That kind of thing. And then how can you leverage that and develop their certain strategies for working with different types of people, because that's where you become effective. You can communicate effectively, you're gonna go far, you're gonna become a manager and a leader in your organization. Now, these are the courses that we're offering in the program, and we do have what I call these, you know, three different types of courses. So we've got method courses where we're gonna teach you how to do analytics, okay? Things like analytic modeling, acquisition analysis of data, pricing analytics, that kind of stuff. We're gonna teach you how to do that. And then we're gonna have these application courses. So how do you do analytics and marketing? How do you do it in operations and supply chain? How do you do it in financial analytics? And this is something that, you know, I've been talking about this quite a bit because we do get um, some pushback actually from people saying, oh, I'm never gonna go into marketing. Why do I need to take a marketing course? I'd rather take something else. Well, the important of these application courses is to give you an awareness of what kind of problems organizations have in these different areas, 
But even more important than that is what kind of data do they have? And I would argue this is one of the biggest differences in organizations from today and 10 years ago is that, you know, 10 years ago, each business unit, right, had their own data. And in fact, some cases had their own IT groups, right? Their own databases, everything. And nobody ever shared. Marketing had their data, finance had their data, accounting had their data, and they didn't want to share it with anybody. In today's world, you know, the C-suite knows that data is power. And so they want to make sure that that data is available to everybody in the organization. And so you're starting to see tool, well, cloud computing, right? Tools like Snowflake. Uh, Databricks, Microsoft Fabric, all that kind of stuff democratizes data so it's available to everybody in the organization. The problem with that, though, is that there's so much data that you don't know what you don't know. So if you haven't taken like a marketing analytics course, you don't know what kind of marketing data actually exists and because you're never going to get access to something if you don't ask specifically for it. And so I... Some of you may have heard this example from me before, but if you are in the supply chain and operations side and you're thinking about building a new distribution center, what do you want to know? You want to know the marketing. You want to know the marketing data. Okay, what's customer segmentation? Where are our customers? Let's build the distribution center close to the customers. That makes sense. And that's something that's a simple evaluation that couldn't have been done 10 years ago because the marketing people never shared their data. But all of a sudden now the operations team can get access to marketing and can understand, you know, where are the customers? Let's build the distribution center in that space. It's something as what I think is simple as that, but it's a significant change in the mindset of organizations today. Uh, and then the last type of courses are what we call those power skill courses, right? And so this gets back to our business school roots. We want, again, to understand people and how do you motivate people? How do you persuade people? How do you work with people? And so we've got an AI and ethics course. We've got leading change, which is about developing a strategy and change management. And we've got courses like introduction to management. And then we've got our project leadership course and entrepreneurship and innovation course, which are actually electives, um, but they lend themselves. They're non-technical but they do lend themselves to working with others and making sure that these projects can happen effectively and a different mindset too with entrepreneurship and innovation. Now we have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's two different delivery formats for this program. We have an in-person format in Toronto. We have our facility, it's at 200 Front Street West, right at the corner of Simcoe and Front. Um, there are two start dates for here. So we start in January and then we start again in April. Essentially what you'll be doing with this course or the in-person format is you attend class one night each week. So like say every Wednesday, for example, and then one weekend day for the full weekend day, bi-weekly, and it's all lasts for 12 months. So there's a lot of class time for sure. And this is an opportunity for you to work with your teams and get to know people and, and do that in this in-person format in Toronto. Um, our classroom facility there is really close to subway, go train, Union Station, all that kind of stuff. So it's super convenient, easy to get to. There's lots of parking around there. The Metro Toronto Convention Center is right across the road as well. Plus Simcoe Place has its own parking. Um, the in-person format program also has two one-week sessions that you come to Queen's University in Kingston, okay? So when you think about this, um, we have the opening session where you get introduced to your teams and coaching and, and start taking your first courses. Uh, and then the second session is usually for our electives. And again, it's about halfway or a little past the halfway mark of the program. And it's an opportunity for you to just you know, get away from home, get away from work, uh, focus on being a student full time and then and learn and work with others. Um, it's a very, uh, you know, very collegial environment. It's very important. These sessions are required. So you must leave work in order to come down and do these sessions. And, uh, you know, they're like I said, you'll learn a lot during these sessions. And it gives you that chance of just being a full time student again and not having to worry about things like walking the dog or taking out the garbage. You're here, you're focused, and uh, you're participating fully. And then throughout the 12 months of the program, too, there is ongoing team coaching. 
Uh, there's also networking, there's career support, which I'm gonna talk about on another slide. Um, but all those kinds of supports uh, I, I, that you would expect, I think, from a business school are available to you in this program as well. Now, for the blended learning format, um, we, again, we have, there's been quite a bit of interest in this, uh, in blended learning. So we now have two start dates for it. So January and May. Um, basically, it's called a blended learning format because there are in-person sessions. There is what we call asynchronous uh, material in course websites. So, you know, self-paced online learning, but there's also synchronous um, learning as well. So think about a lecture on Zoom. And this is how we teach our courses. Primarily, the most is, uh, you know, online with Zoom. Um, and then that allows you really to take this program from anywhere in the world. And we actually have had students who have been in, you know, Saudi Arabia, Eastern Europe, um, China, Singapore, all across Canada, we get students from Newfoundland to British Columbia and up into Yukon as well. And so, you know, this is a great opportunity to actually learn about, you know, a, a bigger variety of industry, you know, and, and what's going on in those industries. Everything from like shipping natural resources to government to financial institutions to tech companies, all that kind of stuff. Um, so it gives you a little bit more variety in the classroom than you would get in the Toronto, which is Toronto is based in uh, financial institutions, consulting, retail, um, boutique companies, that kind of thing. Um, for the blended learning format, there's also two uh, in-person one-week sessions. They're separate, they're scheduled a little bit differently. So one's an opening session and one's a closing session. Again, they are both mandatory. So the opening session, um, the one in January is going to be in Toronto, which means the closing session will be in Kingston. Um, again, like I said, this mandatory, you have to be there for those. Uh, the opening session is where you get introduced to your teams, your coaching, your classmates. And then the closing session is really about next steps, right? Where am I going from this? Alumni networks, um, career search, all that kind of stuff. And the same thing with the blended learning format, we still have the online or ongoing coaching, networking and support for the careers development and that kind of stuff. Um, and so there's a lot of things for you to get involved even though you're doing it through Zoom. Now I did mention we are a technical uh, program. So these are a few of the languages and tools that we'll use in the program. Um, officially, if you asked us, we would say that we are tool agnostic. So generally these things will give you access to, you can use them if you want to, you don't have to, if you don't want to. Um, and a lot of these companies like Databricks and Snowflake and Microsoft, right? They have a whole lot of online learning as well, which we can help you support. And we can also introduce you to some workshops and things on how to do these as well. Um, you will have to use Python programming for sure in the program because that's that new foundational piece, especially in machine learning um, and analytics as well. And so you will have some assignments in Python. So it's a good idea you know about Python before you start the program. And uh, But these other tools are certainly available to you throughout as well. Now, who's teaching you? So we do have a lot of um, tenure track faculty uh, who teach in this program as well. So when you think of tenure track faculty, those are your standard professors work full time at universities. They do research in these areas. Um, they're very skilled and knowledgeable. Quite often they'll be doing some uh, corporate uh, consulting as well in this space. So they're coming in with not only strong, strong research backgrounds, but also strong corporate affiliations and knowledge as well. Um, there are a few adjunct faculty who we bring in from industry, especially when they have some very specific knowledge about how does this happen in the real world. Uh, and so we'll bring in these adjunct faculty to, uh, to help teach those kinds of very applicable courses as well. Now, this whole uh, program and the experience and the curriculum is all guided by our Smith Analytics and AI Advisory Board. Um, so you can see here, we've had Mark Schaefer from uh, Disney. He's been our chair for literally about 10 years now. Um, and he has just uh, stepped back. So he is past chair on the board, so he's still there. 
and Lori Beda from Bank of Montreal. So she has taken over the role as chair, and we're really looking forward to see what's going on with that um, and some great new directions. But this advisory board, they make sure they evaluate our curriculum and they make sure that what we teach is what these people need to hire, right? They, our skills will match directly with what they're looking for in these organizations and making sure that we, uh, you know, we listen to them and we make adjustments in our curriculum um, to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the people. As a quick example of this, we've transitioned from, you know, having like a no code environment where we're using SAS Enterprise Miner and uh, IBM's Watson for a while. And then when it was very quickly realized that um, uh, financial institutions primarily were worried about regulation uh, and, and, you know, understanding the step by step of decision making in analytics i.e. Watson and Enterprise Miner were kind of what they call black box um, analytics tools. And so you couldn't see how that they made their decision. And so there's a lot of worry about things like bias in the data and in the machine learning models. And so what we had to do and what our companies did, especially led by the banks, um, they switched from using these black box tools into using open source tools. So they were starting with our programming, um, but the thing <clears throat> R has sort of, it's a little bit more restrictive. And so what we've done is we've come up and we've made the shift to Python programming. Now, Python is a little bit more versatile. It allows you to do a bit more machine learning, supervised learning stuff than what R used to do. So right now we're really focused on Python in the program. And that's all information that we got from our advisory board members. Okay, so what happens when you're a student in the program? <clears throat> so, you know, we've got the curriculum, we've got those courses, you know, it's a team-based program. Um, but as a student, you have this opportunity to participate in a lot more. We do have a number of professional workshops. A lot of these workshops are actually offered through all of the programs here at Smith's. We've got about 14 or 15 different professional graduate programs now, including MBA students, Master of Finance, uh, Digital Product Management, Financial Innovation Technology. Um, and so there's all these different courses, uh, Entrepreneurship and Innovation as well. Um, so they offer these workshops to everybody. Quite often, these ones are done virtually as well. So there's no limit to how many people can attend. And it just gives you an opportunity to sort of interact with other students at Smith, but also learn some pretty important topics like, you know, how to effective communications, difficult conversations, that kind of stuff. And then more specifically to analytics and AI uh, and innovation technology programs, we do have technical workshops as well. So we will help you out and get, run you through some uh, some introductions to Python, SQL, Tableau, SAS. Um, SAS now has Bio, which is cloud-based, which is great. Uh, we recently had a couple of workshops around Microsoft Fabric, which you know literally I think was announced or made public yesterday are publicly available yesterday through Microsoft. So our students were able to be introduced to Fabric a few weeks ago. Um, so they've got a head start <clears throat> on industry. There's also opportunities for you to really participate in clubs, um, student leadership opportunities. We have a student government um, for each cohort in the program as well. So, you know, if you really want to work on your resume and say, hey, I was the cohort president, um, that kind of stuff goes far, right? When you're uh, doing this. We also have a Smith Business Club and Analytics and AI. So even upon graduation, you'll have access to this subgroup of our alumni network who are really focused on analytics and AI. And within that group, we also have women in analytics as well. So, you know, that's a, another very important group. So if you want to get involved with that, and how can women in analytics get to leadership positions and, and things like that? So they'll hold like speaker events, panels, that kind of stuff. And then there's a number of cross-program initiatives here at Smith as well. We do have our Scotiabank Center for Customer Analytics, uh, which is a literally a research center that's funded through Scotiabank. 
And so we work on a number of research-based projects with them. Um, QAF is the Queen's University Alternate Asset Fund. So if you like the idea of investments, uh, running your own funds, um, using real money, uh, QAF might be for you. Uh, and then we have, a, a, again, cross-program club and equity, diversity, and inclusion. And so that's something else you can get involved if that's uh, one of your passions. Now, what does your class look like? <clears throat> so right now, the, the MMA program, the average age is about 32 years old. But that, of course, is an interesting statistic in and of itself on an average. But I think the range is much more interesting. We have a range of 22 to 52. So if you think about what happens there, you know, the 22-year-old comes in with like very strong technical and programming skills. The 52-year-old comes in with extensive business experience and political acumen, knowing how to get things done inside an organization. And we put these different people on teams together and it becomes very effective. You're learning from one another as much as anything, and you're becoming very effective in working with those different demographics people. Um, average work experience, seven to eight years. Management experience is three years. So we're generally are people who are, you know, just making that push. They've been working for a little bit. They see uh, a future, right, where they want to be a leader and get into management, uh, specifically in the analytics space. <clears throat> and so that's primarily what our students um, sort of look like. Okay, and as a student here at Smith, uh, you have full access to our Career Advancement Center, and they have a specific career management framework that they go by. Um, and so they've got, you know, everything from workshops on how to write a cover letter to a resume, to how do you do interviews, how do you get references, how do you do searching um, for jobs, that kind of stuff. How do you identify what's the perfect job for you? Um, there's coaches available as well. So if you say, hey, you know what? Uh, you know, I'm 30 years old now, but I want to get to that C-suite. I got to be there. I want to be able to figure out all the steps that are involved over the next 20 years for me to go from where I am today to being in the C-suite. And our coaches, our career coaches, can help you sort of map that out a little bit too. They can provide you some information. They can give you some, some examples of people who have gone through the same process that you've gone through. They can help you think about the different companies and industries that you might want to work in to get to meet those goals. And they can provide you with all that kind of support <clears throat> as well. They also run a number of like networking type events, helping to understand your personal brand and what you have to offer to organizations and prep you for interviews. There's a lot of funky interviews out there with tech companies and stuff these days. Um, they can help you with that. And, you know, again, connect you with people who have done this before and have been successful. Okay, and this program itself um, also it provides you with, you know, a, a, what do I call a gateway to professional certifications. So the important thing to know here is that our program, just by taking the program, it does not provide you with <clears throat> all the requirements to get these certifications, okay? If you think about, well, all three of them will have professional exams you have to pass, but we do give you the academic hours towards something like professional management, uh, PMP profession, that kind of thing. Um, so we do give you that foundational piece, but there will be some work that you have to do beyond that in order to get these certifications. Now, what are the requirements to come in and do this program? So it is a master's degree. So you do have to have an undergraduate degree from a recognized university. Uh, inside that, we do ask for official transcripts or a WES assessment. And what we want to see is at least one mathematics or statistics course that generally covers linear regression and how to use it. Um, and then we would be looking for, you know, at least a B average on that course as well. So it's very important that you have that sort of what I would call a quantitative assessment foundation, right? We want you to know that you can do math and stats before you jump into this program because there's a lot of math and stats in this program. So that's going to be really important for you. Uh, it is a what we call a professional program. So we do look for a minimum of two years of work experience for you to join. 
we want you <clears throat> to come into the classroom with some experience of what actually happens in an organization. And so that's a little bit different than, you know, what happens in internships and that kind of stuff and school projects. Uh, we want to be able to have you contribute wholesomely, right, to the class environment. And so that's why we look for this work experience. Uh, as part of the requirements, you do need two letters of reference. They do not have to be academic references. They can be, you know, what we probably want is like one supervisor and one coworker reference. Um, we do have forms to fill out and they are anonymous and that kind of stuff. So, so that's an important part of the, the application process as well. Uh, I think I already mentioned official transcripts from an undergraduate institution. Um, a resume and a cover letter will get you started. And then interview is how you stop uh, or you finish the application process. Um, now, as far as the GMAC goes, um, we always want you to talk to us first before you start the GMAC. You know, from a personal perspective, um, I'd much rather have you studying things like statistical analysis, linear regression, um, SQL programming, Python programming, than spending time practicing for the GMAT, because I know that can take several months for you to do that and to write it effectively. So make sure you talk to us first, you know, get us uh, looking at who you are and what you're all about um, before. We may turn around and say, nah, we really think that, you know, your academics are kind of weak in this area, write the GMAT, apply again for the next start. Um, that's quite possible, but, you know, talk to us first. And then what does that look like when you actually do talk to us? So what we do here at Smith is we actually assign you an application advisor. Uh, these advisors uh, will basically they'll start the process by looking at your transcript, your resume, um, and that could be an unofficial transcript. If you have a copy of um, your original transcript, that would be fine to get you started. Um, we would like to have um, some kind of a cover letter or letter of intent as well at that point, and that will start your application. So the letter of intent, the tra unofficial transcript, and your resume, that will sort of get you into what we'll call the pipeline, the application pipeline. Once you've got that, then our application advisors will complete a preliminary assessment based on the information that you've given us. And then they will guide you through that process. They will say, ooh, you're a bit weak here, or you know what, you're good to go. Let's uh, let's push this through. Let's get your references. Let's get your official transcript. Um, the application advisors are really your benefactor in this as well. So basically you work closely with them, making sure that your application is as strong as possible. The advisor will guide you through that to make sure that you identify you know, the weak spots, what you can do to overcome those weak spots and present the strongest case possible. So that when I actually see your application file, when it comes to the director, um, we know that this is an applicant that's all set, ready to go. And then when we have the interview with you, then we can have that final discussion about, you know, who are you? Why do you want to do this? Where do you plan on going with this degree? And how are you going to help, um, you know, future classes and the alumni network and that kind of stuff? All that is very important. Now, another key thing for us is that we do what we call rolling admission. So the only real cutoff date is usually about two weeks before a program starts. OK, we have quite a bit of flexibility in classroom size, um, but these programs are quite popular. So what we will end up doing is we'll accept your applications. We'll continue going through with your um, like your application and the interview and that kind of stuff. And then what we'll do is we'll run a wait list if the classroom is full. And so you'll get put onto the wait list. And as people defer, we have lots of different reasons for people to defer, whether it's monetary or family or what have you. Um, if somebody defers, then we'll bring you off the wait list. And then when we actually basically get to, you know, a week before the actual program starts, then we'll take you off the wait list. We'll put you on to the next start date. We'll work with you to see if that's something that works for you. And then you'll be probably offered admission to the next start date as well. So that's why we move by rolling. We never actually stop recruiting. There are no real deadlines. Um, as you can think about that process, it's always better to get your application in early 
um, because the pool and the competition isn't quite so large at that point. So make sure you get this stuff done as quickly as possible. Get into the queue, get that interview, and hopefully get accepted to the program. Now this is um, this edX MicroMasters program. It is a what we'll call a pathway into the MMA program. Um, if you complete this successfully, you will get advanced credit for two courses in our program. So MMA 863, the introduction to analytic modeling, and 867 is predictive modeling. Um, by bypassing those two courses, there will be a reduction in program fees. But, um, and this is a, quite a big but, um, this program itself is offered through MIT. Um, so the thing is, it's actually quite expensive and it's very, very difficult. Um, it's highly technical. Um, it is specifically around statistics and data science. And so, and it takes, um, you know, two years to complete this certificate. So I would always argue that if you haven't started this yet, then look at our program and just go direct entry into the MMA program. If you have started it, definitely continue it if you can. Um, look at your return on your investment and that sort of thing. And um, because it is a very good program for sure. I don't want to take away from that. It's very good. It's extremely technical. Uh, it is very much focused on statistics and data science. There's not much management or business in it, um, but it does lead you into our program as a pathway. Okay, so we've got um, two start dates, which means we also have two sets of program fees. So if you start the program in January 2024, um, the domestic program fees are 43,840 Canadian dollars. If you're an international applicant, there'll be 79,900 Canadian dollars. These are all inclusive program fees. Okay, so it includes your tuition, plus your books, your learning materials, case studies, that kind of thing, all your meals and accommodations for residential sessions, all software licenses, um, everything you need to do. When you come for our in-person sessions, basically what you do is you, you have to pay for your travel to get to the site. Once you get there, you check in at the hotel. We'll take care of all the costs at that point right there. Any kind of social events that we do, the dinners, like I said, meals, accommodations, that kind of stuff are all part of these fees. <clears throat> the, the fee itself is broken down into a deposit of $2,000. That was what holds your spot after you've been accepted to the program. And then the remainder is uh, divided between three installment payments over the year. So, for example, the January start, um, the big installment is due January 1, there's another one May 1, and the third one is September 1, so that you're all finished up before you finish the program in December. Now, for the April-May start program, the fees do go up, um, and so the domestic price of the program is $45,490 Canadian dollars. For international students, it's 83700 Canadian dollars. Same kind of deal, all-inclusive fees. Uh, we cover all the tuition, books, learning materials, meals, accommodations, and all the software licenses and things. Um, and again, it'll be broken down into the deposit and the three installment payments. Now, when you're thinking about paying for the program and all the different financing options, um, for domestic students, uh, we do have an agreement with the Royal Bank of Canada, RBC. You can get a student line of credit there. Um, you do have to follow the standard application process. And what I found is that, you know, you don't really get a better deal by using RBC. So generally, um, what I've heard anecdotally anyway, is that you just work with the bank that you've always worked with. And most banks have student lines of credits, and this is definitely works for that. Um, so you can apply there. I, you know, just like shopping for a mortgage, you go for different options, different banks, and see what's going to be the best deal for you. Uh, the MMA program is OSAP eligible. So that means that not only is it um, Ontario Student Assistance Plan in Ontario, um, but generally that means that it, it goes for provincial student assistance plans, um, British Columbia, Alberta, Manitoba, that kind of stuff as well. Um, but this is not guaranteed, and I cannot guarantee that you're eligible for that. So this is based on an individual application that you will make to your provincial organization that does that. 
Um, in Canada, you can also borrow from your RSPs through the lifelong learning plan and tuition tax credits. Um, and then there are a couple of scholarship opportunities. So we have an entrance scholarship uh, generally reserved for people who come into the program with uh, a very high GPA from their undergrad. So we'd be looking at a GPA of like anywhere from 3.8 to 4.3 on that, you know, three or zero to 4.3 scale. Um, so we, you, we definitely want to see significant um, uh, good grades there, Dean's Honors List, all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, we also have a couple of entrance scholarships um, to encourage Black and Indigenous students to join our programs. And we do have the Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence Scholarship. Um, there's not a lot of the Vector scholarships, and there's a very strict timeline for that. So, for example, if you were thinking of Vector scholarship and wanted to do the January start, those deadlines have already passed. So you would have to be fully enrolled in the program and get ready to start the program in May. And then you might meet the eligibility requirements um, probably in January, February. So if that's something that's on your mind, um, take a look at those deadlines, making sure again, Vector requires very high academic standards. So you do need to have you know, an AA plus um, 3.8, 4.3 GPA uh, in order to be considered for that scholarship. Okay, so as of today, because we're getting very close to the January start, um, we do have about two weeks, really, um, to get applicants in for January for both the, the blended and the in-person. Uh, we're getting very, very, very close to the end of the recruitment cycle for those and, and almost building into wait lists. So if you really want to start in January, um, you need to speak with the application advisors right away and make sure you get all your stuff in, um, in the, you know, within the next few weeks. Um, if you want to do April, again, uh, interest is always high in these programs. So I, you know, I would definitely say apply very soon for the April start as well. Um, if you're an international student, uh, I think the, the January 2024 start date is probably not going to work for you in order to get student visas and all that kind of stuff. Um, but for the April 2024 start, uh, again, we do look for these applications. They're going to close in about a month's time. So it's really important that you get there, get that started, and make sure you can apply for your student visa as quickly as possible. Um, but we are also accepting applications for a January 2025 start for international students. That gives you about a year, and that might be a good thing considering you know the delays in visa um, processing and that kind of stuff. So if that's what you're thinking about, if you're an international student, uh, again, don't sort of give up, talk to our application advisors, they can guide you through this process and they can make sure you're all set up to join the program at the earliest possible point. Okay, and just as a quick sort of summary, remember this is about business. We're a business school. We know and we have seen consistently over the past 10 years that we've been running this MMA program that analytics and these insights from analytics provide tremendous business value to organizations. We are seeing this now. Most organizations have embraced this. They are looking for a lot of analytics professionals and talent to join their organizations because, you know, since the pandemic, they actually have to rebuild a lot of their models. They're re-looking at what data is available and how they can leverage that data. And they need people that can help them through this process. And that could be you, right? Um, we also know that analytics doesn't work without those strong power skills, right? The people. You need people who can develop a vision and build out a strategy. We need people who can lead their teams effectively through this kind of change, because this is a significant change in the decision-making process of most organizations right now. And in order to get buy-in and to be successful, they need strong leaders to guide the organization through this. And again, this is done through people, right? The collaboration amongst people, amongst traditional business units. Um, you know, the new teams of today, 
uh, what we call high performing teams, they're going to include people from many traditional business pillars, right? It's not just an IT team getting together. It's probably going to be somebody from finance, somebody from marketing, somebody from supply who are going to be working together to solve these business problems. And ultimately, our uh, big goal is to make sure we have a digital culture in our organization. And again, if you're going to be a leader in that organization, you have to understand digital, you have to understand analytics, data, and decision-making processes. And this is what's going to be truly successful. Okay, so then the only other question is, are you ready? And if you are, I encourage you to uh, visit our website there, fill out the application as quickly as possible, get that information into us. Like I said, all you need resume, uh, an unofficial transcript, and probably as quickly as possible, some kind of letter of intent or a cover letter. And then that will allow us to assign you an application advisor who will then do a preliminary assessment and get you all set, ready to go. Okay, and then here's my contact information. Um, that QR code connects with my LinkedIn profile. So I'm happy to connect with people there. Um, we are connected with people. We're constantly sharing information about analytics and different companies and jobs and all that kind of stuff on LinkedIn as well. So I encourage you to, uh, to connect with me there and uh, learn a little bit more about what we do here at Smith and in the analytics world. Okay, so I've got a few questions here and I've got a very short time period to do that. So, um, so Li Shang Guo says that for the in-person program, are all classes recorded? No, they're not recorded. Um, they, uh, you know, the expectation for in-person classes is that you attend the class. We actually do have an academic regulation that says you cannot miss more than 25% of a courses class. Um, so it's really important that you show up there in person. Again, it's a team-based program. So you want to be there for your team as well. So that's extremely important. Okay. Uh, is there a change that students from blended learning in person will meet, to, or is there a chance, I suppose? Um, so actually for the January start, um, there won't be specifically, um, but for the May start, or April, May start, um, I've been actually working with the other director, Jen, and so we're going to be running the opening session together. Um, well, of course, the classes and stuff will be separate, but we'll be inside Goods Hall at Queens at the same time. And so we'll be sharing some social events, networking events, um, boat crews, all that kind of fun stuff. So, so yes, you'll be able to get there. Um, if you're a blended learning student in the GTA, uh, you can actually, you know, you'll be invited to any in-person events at our Simcoe Place uh, location. So um, you'll have those kind of opportunities as well to, uh, to meet with people. Um, is there an applied work learning or co-op for this program? There is not um, because most of our students, we expect our students to be um, working full time as they take this program. Now, if you are an international student and you're here on a work permit or a study permit, um, you can work a certain number of hours and there are some internships, particularly the MyTax Business Strategy Initiative uh, internship. Um, you can do those as well. So they get posted on our Career Center's job board and you can apply for those if you want. But there's nothing official to the program itself. Um, passing grade for the program. So inside our academic regulations, um, you can only have one D minus in the program and you can only have two C minus or less in the program. So those are the requirements. Uh, what will happen is that uh, you'll end up having a conversation with me, actually, if, uh, if you end up getting a D minus in a course, um, we'll be having a conversation about uh, next steps and whether or not you should be continuing in the program. Uh, why are fees different for winter intake and spring intake? Um, it's as simple as fiscal year. So our fiscal year starts May 1st. And so, and each fiscal year or each, um, when we have the program fees, they have to be approved by our board of trustees here at Queens. And that all happens in May as well. So, so basically if you saw my slide there, there's a little disclaimer says it's to be uh, approved by the board of trustees. 
So that's why. So any kind of fee increases will always happen as of May 1st at Queens. So it's the same for undergraduate tuition and everything else. Uh, this program has a maximum of two classes a week. So is it considered a full-time program? Um, so, yes, it is considered a full-time program in the eyes of the government, for sure. It's the number of hours of class time that you have to look at, not the number of days you're in class. Uh, are there any analytics backgrounds required or any undergraduate degree is fine? So, no, not, well, basically, we would be looking at you as an entire applicant, right? We want to understand your work experience. We want to understand your career goals. We want to, want to understand um, what kind of experiences you had and your undergraduate degree. So it does matter. Um, one of the most important parts of that is quantitative knowledge, right? We want you to be successful knowing the quants, being able to do statistics, being able to do, you know, the mathematics part of building models and testing models and making sure the models are suitable. Those are all things that are extremely important for you um, to be successful in the program. So what we want to do is in our evaluation of applicants, we want to make sure you're going to be successful in the program. We don't want you to come plan on taking this program and then struggling with the academics piece, right? We want to know that you can do it. We're here to teach you. So we don't have an expectation that you know everything. Um, we're here to teach you, but we wanna know that you're gonna be successful in the program. Uh, what is the program's acceptance rate? What is the class size? So each class is roughly, um, like each cohort is somewhere between 65 and 75 students. Um, the program's acceptance rate. So what will happen is we actually really don't have that statistic because what we'll do is when we introduce you to your application advisor, they will work with you. So before you even like make a full application, they will let you know if, you know, you look good on paper kind of thing. And then those are the people that go forward. So uh, it is extremely, I mean, we have thousands and thousands of inquiries into this program each year. Uh, and like I said, each cohort, we bring in, you know, let's say 65 to 75 students. So, uh, you know, I can give you those kind of statistics. It's like two or 3% uh, will get through. Um, but of course, not all those inquiries are actually interested in taking the program. So, um, so yes, it's a difficult program to get into, but no, if you think you're good, you know, talk to an application advisor. Okay. And what specific courses can be taken via online learning MOOCs? Uh, I'm not entirely certain what you mean by that, uh, Kenny. Um, we don't accept credits from other programs because this is a team-based cohort program. So you do have to take all of our courses um, to get credit in our courses in order to go on to the next courses. Uh, is this program suitable for people who completed a master's of engineering with 20 years of experience? Is it equivalent to MBA or job prospects the same? So, um, well, it's equivalent to an MBA in that it's a master's degree recognized in Ontario. Um, so I'd say that is an equivalent piece. Um, depends on the job you're looking for and what you're trying to do. Uh, if you are making a pivot from a, a professional engineer role, into becoming an analytics professional. Um, you know, your 20 years experience is gonna be helpful for sure. You're gonna have a good understanding of that. But again, you'll have to um, sort of manage expectations there, I think. If you think you're, um, you know, what kind of role you're looking for and that kind of stuff. Uh, MBAs are still extremely important if you wanna to get to that C-suite, right? You wanna have that more holistic view of an organization. You wanna be able to understand HR, leadership, accounting, economics, all that kind of stuff. You're not gonna get those specific courses in this program. This program is very specific to analytics. Uh, statistics on employment rate after graduation. So uh, again, that's a very interesting, um, thing because most of our students are working <laughs> during the program. So it's not like an undergraduate program where you'll take it, 
you know, and then go out and get a job. Um, so, you know, it's very easy for me to say that, you know, oh, we've got, you know, 95 to 100 percent of our students are working. Um, it's because they start the program working as well. Um, what I always want to know, if people have a question about their career, or what they want to see themselves or where they want to go, um, take a look at LinkedIn, go on there, uh, do a search for Smith School of Business, <clears throat> search for the MMA degree, and take a look at our graduates. We've got like I think 1,700, 1,700 graduates out there now who've taken the MMA program. And you can see their career journeys, right? Because everyone's LinkedIn profile is like an online resume. And you can see the jobs they've got, the promotions they've received, the companies they've been working for. Um, that is by far, that could be your first data mining uh, project you want to do, is take a look, see if you see yourself in one of those applicants. And again, reach out to them. Hey, hey, let's have a coffee chat. Let's talk to you about, you know, how, how you went through the program. What did you do since the program? And that kind of stuff. That's all the beginning of networking. And that's really important to be proactive uh, when you're looking at this. Okay, I'm three minutes past my time. So I apologize for that. Um, hopefully, uh, we've been able to answer your questions. If we haven't, make sure you reach out to us, fill in that get to know you form online, start your application as quickly as possible. And hopefully, I'll see you in either January or May. Okay, thanks a lot.